But I'm here to speak um, on the I said when he sent me the, the list, I was like, oh, I said, I might have to steal the Sturm and Steeries idea um, for our church. So the church where I'm ministering now is Priestly Community Church over in, uh, well, actually the last month, we was just at the start of that, um, that journey. Um, I've been there for four years, and um, two of those being the last two years. Interesting, I think. And God's been doing stuff and working in us. And we're going to be talking about that this morning. It's that God is at work in his people, his purposes to perform, and in this world for his glory and for our good. But God's at work for his glory and our good. And those two things are synonymous. They're the same thing. God is glorified then it's good for his creatures, his creation. And so we're going to open with God's word today, we're going to read Romans in a moment, but before we do, can I just pray for us, and pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, will meet with us and cause us to think great thoughts about Jesus. Father God, we come to you as your creatures, knowing that we depend on you for everything, every good thing that we have comes from your hand. Lord, we recognise this morning that the breath in our bodies was a gift was given to us from you. Lord, this word, this book that I hold in my hand was given from you. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come, meet with us, change us, transform us, cause us to be more like Jesus, our precious Saviour, that you would see your work completed in us, and the world would see the gospel lived out, the hope of the nation. Look to you. Holy Spirit, we depend on you. Father God, we thank you. Pray well in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to read a passage from Romans chapter 6, um, and then I'm going to do something that I generally, whenever I'm telling people to do a a little preaching cluster that we're setting up in our church, a Bible teaching cluster. And when I've been talking to them, I say, like, like, don't use cross references to heaven. I'm going to use cross references this morning. So I'm glad I'm at my home church so they can't throw that back at me. But we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6 and the second half. So starting at verse 15, uh, Paul's writing and he's writing to the church saying that this is uh, the gospel. And he says in verse 15 of chapter 6, Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, death, or of obedience, and uh, or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, from slaves of righteousness, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the God of righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things that you were now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end to The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, that's some good stuff there. And uh, as we go through, and I've just got four little segments that I want us to look at and thought, and some of you will have seen, I've got my notes on there. Some of you will have seen that I popped some props out here. So there's four people here, advanced warning, and then the volunteers. And that's actually my daughter to left the room, so I can't <laughs> rely on them. I've asked you. Uh, I'm going to need some volunteers to help me. But as we look at this, I just 
see that it kind of falls into these four sections, this passage, and the first one that I type in is a dog or a horse. I have a friend at university, and uh, I, I, went, I studied in Aberystwyth in Wales, and I'm a big uh, rugby fan, and so we used to go and watch the rugby, and I used to wear with pride my England rugby top. And one of my friends, Gareth, from the Valley, used to call me to one side and say, Philip, what's that? Yeah, but what, what are you wearing? What do you mean? She said, well, your mum's Welsh, your dad's half Welsh, why are you wearing an England rugby top? What do you mean? Well, look, look at it this way. He said, if a dog is born in a stable, does that make it a horse? He said, you're a Welshman. I'm born in Hereford, and I'm not aware of the English gym. But why did I tell you that story? Well, Paul sets up in these first few verses, verses 15 and 16, you've got a choice to make about what, whether your obedience and your allegiance is going to lie. And he says that you're either going to be a slave to sin and ultimately to death, or to obedience and righteousness. And Paul is responding to a criticism from devout Jewish believers. They got a real concern that this good, this gospel that Paul is teaching is a gospel of grace. Don't love that word grace? God's free gift. And they got a real concern that hang on, if you're telling people that God gives us his grace, his forgiveness, he saves us, and all those things that you've been looking at in this series of regeneration, <coughs> justification, adoption, salvation, redemption, if all of that is ours by God's free gift, then why would people choose to obey the law? They're just going to go on sinning so that grace may abound, as they say. And Paul says, absolutely not. Did not really understand it. The great Bible teacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, used to say and has written that if you have ever, if you have never, as somebody who proclaims the gospel, this good news about Jesus, he says, if you've never been accused of, let's find another big word here, antinomianism, it doesn't mean you're against God in Okay? Antinomianism means that you're against the law. If you're not accused of being against the law, then you're not preaching the gospel, what John said. But if people hear your message about Jesus, they go, hey, I mean, what you're saying is that I can do what I want, and God gives me his love and his acceptance and his peace and his, uh, and his spirit. And what John says, if people don't, if there's not the sniff of that, if there's not the possibility of you being misunderstood, then you're probably teaching a legal message. You're probably teaching salvation through the world. And Paul is right to say, no, no, like, you don't get saved by what you do, by obedience. But you are set free as slaves. You, you're no longer slaves to uh, disobedience, but to righteousness. And so the first thing I want to tell you, sanctification, this big word that we're considering this morning, it, it kind of means, have you heard the sanctus, 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 holy, holy? It's what the angels sing in heaven when they're surrounding God in their praises. They say, holy, holy, holy. And, and it's from there that we get this word sanctification. It means to be set apart, to be, um, to be holy, to be um, sacred. And so this process that we Christians go through of sanctification is one of being set apart, of being like God in First Peter says that God has said, be holy as I am holy. So I want to talk to you about sanctification that comes set in this framework in a process that is important for us because as, as Western process-minded people, we like a process that goes in a linear fashion. And we'll think about that in a moment. But, but it's a process that is both passive and active in the Christian's life. So if you believe on Jesus, this big Bible word of sanctification is something that will happen passively, in one sense, but also actively in another. 
What do you mean? Well, in another letter of the New Testament, Paul writes to the Philippian church, and he says the two verses. Come on, come on a minute. So, how can he say that? After that? In Philippians 1, verse 6, he says that he is confident that he who has done a good work in you will see it to completion. That's a great message of encouragement, that is. If you're here this morning, the trust in Jesus, that Paul, and I'm echoing Paul's words to you, saying that you can have confidence knowing that he who began that work in you is going to see it to completion. Who began it? Who began the work? You? Somebody's preaching? No, no, it was God who began that work in you. And so all of it rests in God's character. God's will will be done. And so you're becoming more holy, more Christ like, more like Jesus. Is party, it is resting entirely on God's character. He began a good work in you. We'll see it to but then a little bit later in the he read this letter, he then said in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 that each of us should work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So on one hand, God started the work, he's going to see it through to Do we agree with that what was the first verse things to say? And then on the other hand, Paul said, right, so seeing as you are believers, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And it's both of those things. One of the concepts that I try to communicate to our people a lot, it's one of the things that I really kind of want people to understand, is that the Christian life, unfortunately, we love a life of ease, but the Christian life is one of tension. There is tension that is in the life of the Christian, it wasn't there before. Because of various things. And this is one of the things that, on the one hand, the Holy Spirit is opening your heart to transform you and change you and give you new desires and, and guide you and lead you and, and set you free from what's held you captive. But on the one hand, you have that, and then on the other hand, there is a responsibility that rests on us that we give ourselves to that process. And so when we read the Bible, we read God's Word, we Allow the Holy Spirit to take it, change our hearts, and make us more like Jesus. Does that make sense to you? So that as a Christian, it's not just sit back and do nothing, because there you end up with kind of, a, a kind of a, an apathy, a, a lazy Christianity that doesn't see much transformation. And on the other hand, it's not self righteousness that you've got to work your way out of the kingdom. You better be good enough because God is watching. What that means? The message of gospel, of course, says is that it's these two things working together to make you work. So the first thing is that, you know, when you become a believer, there is a, an identity that happens and we live according to that identity. We live wanting to live that out rather than what we once were. And Paul develops that as you go through. But the next one, I can tell you this And I'm kind of going to be anonymous. I think the colour on the team comes out. Is that really good? The next kind of section, verses 17 to 18, uh, where Paul develops this thing here you know, further. He um, I, I titled this Reading or Bathing Soap. Reading or Bathing Soap. There's a story that goes with this. We were visited, we were going to visit some of Bex's friends in Reading. I was driving. Bex was in charge of directions and bathing soap. I was in the driving seat. Bex was in the passenger seat and she plugged all the information into the sound. I, become, if your car's got sat down now, I don't remember how we learned to plan a journey using a, a, an old MacBook. Let me just turn it on. But 
The staff guys will trust it so much, don't we? We come to trust them, we come to rely on them. And so I was just the woman giving me the instructions, and all this happened. <laughs> and as I was driving, I came close to her, and that says to her, okay, should we go this way? Okay, fair enough. And I said, are you sure this is okay? I said, are you sure? And we arrived and it says, you've reached your destination, and I said, yeah, oh no, we haven't. <laughs> Oh yes, you have. I don't know. We haven't. And what had happened was, Bex had not entered one of the digits in yeah. the postcode, yeah. and instead of going where we wanted to go, we ended up in an entirely different place. Well, that's it. That happens to us, doesn't it? Well, I, I want to just look at this verse 17 to 18, where um, of chapter 6, where Paul says this. He says, but thanks be to God, you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient to the heart committed and have been set free from sin. And having, having been set free from sin, righteousness. You see, there's this commitment to a standard of teaching. Paul says that there's this, there's this message that was given to you, and you've given yourself to that, you've become committed and obedient to that. And this teaching has been to you. And part of the Christian journey is why we gather together and why we disciple one another and why we encourage each other to look towards Jesus. Not to look anywhere else, not to look to the latest, whatever it might be, but to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And at this point, I want to, I need to be volunteers. Because not only is sanctification both passive and active in our lives, or passive and active, sorry, for those relying on the location, um, but it's also something that is traditional, progressive, and final. I need to move on to you. Two points. You come out. Stand and wear, I've got here, yeah, I'm sorry. We're going to come back to your face, but I've got a lovely mask for you. I know people thought they'd been three to twice one this morning, eh? Come back from this side. You're going to be film number three? Order, okay? Is that all right if I put that on your head? <laughs> no, no. What a front row this would be, eh? Um, but we've got three here because I want to help you visually see that sanctification is something, when you looked at regeneration and, um, and adoption and all those other things, there's a kind of legal status to it, isn't there? That it, it happens. It's something that is done. Like it's finished. And sometimes we can kind of think about sanctification and, and we expect Other people. The work of sanctification is already been complete. We expect other people to be sanctified. Oh, I can't believe they're behaving in that way. Look at them. They're supposed to be believers. They should be doing that. Well, sanctification is a process. So there is a sense where sanctification is you are going to be positional sanctification. But when you become a Christian, you are sanctified in God's sight, and you are holy and set apart. So that is what sanctification is in its positional truth. Then over here, if we come over here a little bit, we are going to be sanctification in its place very much, progressive state. Okay? And that means that in the life, that is true, but I'm not there yet. And if you get that, I've got another thing to help us. Oh, man. I was going to. <laughs> you want that? I'll try not to go off again. I promise. Anybody know what this is? Bungee cord. Yeah, don't let go. It'll wrap them in the knuckles. But a bungee cord, you know these things, you sort of pull them and they strain and pull. And this progressive sanctification takes me where I am and draws me towards the position of sanctification from Jesus. 
that help the rest of that a little bit for you? That, that I'm, I'm here, but this is pulling me towards what I one day will be, and that is my final sanctification. Where I'll see Jesus, and the Bible says, one day we will see him, and we will be like him. And we'll see him and we will be like him. God doesn't leave us like we were. He loves us so much that he wants to make us what we should be. And so sanctification is that process of drawing me towards what I one day will be in God's sight. Thank you very much. You can keep those marks if you wish. As long as you promise not to perform identity theft and steal the money that doesn't exist in my bank account. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does that, does that visual thing help you then? That sanctification is this thing that is, it is true. In Jesus, you are sanctified. But it's a process that takes me from where I am to where one day I will finally be. Also helps us as Christians to have patience and you know, that buying instruction to bear with one another. <coughs> that one? Yeah. Well that one is all about that process of sanctification. Do you know what? That brother, that sister, they may they might I might find it difficult to get along with them. Praise God, he is transforming them. Degree by degree, little by little, and one Glorious, a glorious prize. You see, I said about Western Christians going the process. I'm beginning to be a bit of a rebel. I don't like systems and things. You know, I'm I, I not. I don't want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like what somebody says we should do to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. But the tricky thing is that we're in a society that loves straight line graph. Have you noticed that? Yeah. That we want to see, that when you become a believer, there's kind of this expectation that if this is the axis, and you've got time on the bottom, and effort on this axis, that it's a straight line graph. If you're really hungry, you're a super Christian. You might even fix the mental curve. You all know about those very crispy TV, you remember them? Yeah. You might even use an exponential, but what about straight line graph? Wouldn't we all settle for that? I don't know about you, but sometimes my the line on my graph kind of resembles that at times. I seem to get in a knot. I seem to get I'm not sure that and I I've come to realise that the moment I get tied up in knots in terms of my sanctification, actually it's fixing my days on a hit. That pulls me towards what I want them to be. I encourage you, you are as you're living this life as you're walking with Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. I'm going to look at verse 19. Verse 19, I, I've labelled this, um, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 19, I've labelled this uh, Paul's Pink Floyd moment. Okay. Sarcastic. I've used these terms because of the limited. And let me read it to you so I don't finish quote. It says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Alright, what? It says your natural limitations, but just as you were once presented in And lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, now present your memory. There's an air of that sarcastic teacher. There were moments when I like that sarcastic teacher when I was in the classroom. But Paul says, actually, that he knows that he's speaking to you. He's the one who knows that we have natural limitations. And he said, I'm speaking in this way in terms of slavery and, and, and framing it in this way, not because you, slavery has certain connotations, but we think. Thing. But Paul's using this image to talk about 
something that he's saying that you've given yourself to. He talks earlier today about being obedient slaves. That's not the process of being forced to but it's giving yourself in service to So it's a choice then. So there was a time when you once gave yourself in service to disobedience. Don't give yourself there anymore, but give yourself to righteousness. Do the worst job that I ever had? Don't say it's wrong. The worst job that I ever had was I worked Back at home, I come back, I had a period of unemployment, and I was working in a recycling plant. And in this recycling plant, I was tasked with the job of taking a bag, a great big bulk bag of coat hangers, feed them into a machine, and that machine then pulled the hooks out of them, and then chipped them, and put them, and glued them into another bulk bag in little pellets. And I made a mistake one day of asking my boss, who was walking around the shop floor, and I went, what happens to those block bags once they're full away? Turn them on the back and then once you've got enough of them, you throw them up on the lorry. So where does that lorry go? It goes to Germany. I said, oh, the Germany? They turn them into coat bags. <laughs> <laughs> you know the moment where you just question everything you're doing? The whole of your coat hanging. I just remember that. It's like just one of those moments of clarity. Like, what is the point? <laughs> Um, but it was the worst job ever, and, and Paul is saying in this moment, he's saying like, you had a choice as believers. You had a rubbish job, and you've got a choice. But like, are you going to show up? Like my boss at that recycling plant would have loved it <laughs> if I turned up dressed ready for work, doing my shit. I was no longer employed there. I was just doing, going through the motions, doing what I was doing, breaking up co-pairs. I love it if I turn up and do that. Who, any employers here who love that? If employees just say, don't worry about boss, I'm here. I know, I know, I don't work here anymore, but I'm just doing it, just doing it. And Paul says, that's what it's like when Christians choose to do things. That's what it's like when Christians choose to behave in a way that is ungodly or unrighteous. Like choosing to turn up to a job that you no longer have. In fact, he said it's worse than that, because if you look down, he continues, he says that, you know, he says about this disobedience, he says, but do not present your members as, uh, to sin instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. <coughs> sorry, it's the same thing I've got to I'm looking at this one But now you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God. And the fruit leads to, and the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. He says that in the day that you show up on the job, you get the CEO of bonus check. That sounds beautiful. Well, the day that you become a believer, you don't have to pay up, you get the CEO's bonus check. You get eternal life. Jesus, that you get Jesus and God and eternal life and all the blessings that flow from that. So when you're going to work for, you're going to work for the wages of sin, Paul says it's death, or you're going to work and give yourself the righteousness which gives us eternal life. When you're going to put the shift in this. Where are you going to put your shift in spiritually? Like this week, tomorrow morning when you get out of bed, are you going to give yourself to unrighteousness? Or are you going to say, no, I don't work there anymore. I'm going to work for the kingdom. I'm going to give myself to righteousness. The whole concept like you hear is one of repentance, turning from greed and generosity, turning from lust. Love. Turning from anger to reconciliation. Turning from jealousy to That's what I'm talking about. It's that process of being able to just change the change of flesh to death and God and his glory. 
Basically, I learned from Dusty and Steve Lewis a great thought here about ordered affections. What in the purpose is of all you? And Dusty and Steve Lewis. And he said, I'm going our problem is not to be loved things too much, to be loved more things too much. Our problem is that we don't love God. So that's the problem in this life. The reason why we feel sometimes we're going to lose Jesus is we've got to that line rather than a straight home drive. Not because we love this world too much, but don't love God enough. I haven't allowed this to be much. Through every cell of my body, that I'm just consumed with this. That is the root cause of all of our problems is that we have a problem with our sins. We don't love God as we want. Where are you going to put your sins? The one thing which is love of all things. Lies the verse that I wrote to you just a moment ago. This I will read. Bring in fourteen. But he lies in Romans six verse fourteen. Just look back at verse fourteen. It says, "For sin will have no dominion over you, not under the law, but under grace." Sin will have no dominion. It doesn't say. Sin might not have them. It doesn't say sin temporarily will have limited. There is a sin will have no dominion. And the key to it is that that is a promise of God. God has said in His Word that sin will have no dominion over you. And so what we do is we choose in the moment to look and say, Your promises are great. And Matthew Henry has a brilliant quote. When I read this when I was preparing for this morning, I was like, so good. And if you just remember one thing this morning, you can ignore everything that Phil Brimley has said, except for what Paul has said, and then hang it off what Matthew Henry has said. God's promises to us are more powerful and effectual for mortifying sin than our promises to God. God's promises to us are more powerful and effective for fortifying that's the death of sin than our promises to God. Oh, I have I find myself full part going, oh, yeah, I've messed up. I've done the thing I said I wouldn't do. I guess you did. I'll do better next time. Okay. That, that Matthew Henry is saying that we take these promises that Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and we say, do you know what sin doesn't have dominion? I don't have to give in to unrighteousness. Why? Because the promise of God is that he dwells within us and gives us power to overcome the enemy. So sanctification is this process, both passive and active. Where are you going to choose? It's still like your adoption in Christ, like your salvation, like your um, justification. It is a done thing, but it is also a progressive thing. God isn't going to leave you the way you are. Inheritance, your promise, what God is going to do in your life. You haven't trusted Jesus. And I encourage you this morning to say this. I mean, no, when the person brought you, when you come speak to me and I'll point you to the direction of somebody you need to But I'm not sure that you trust Jesus. This morning, I want to tell you, 
You don't have to have the wages of death. It's what you earn and righteousness. Eternal life. Eternal life. That sounds like a great choice. God bless you. May God and His Spirit work in you.